glorifying Krishna. Krishna topics are primarily two. Those spoken by Krishna, that's Krishna Kata, his own words, and things spoken about Krishna by pure devotees. Describing his different qualities, his pastimes, his form, and like that. They are very purifying to hear. Hearing is the most important way to enter into the transcendental realm. The Vedas are called Shruti because they're heard. Simply by hearing transcendental knowledge of Krishna and about Krishna is so powerful that it brings one to the platform of liberation just by hearing. Of course, there's some further effort required uh, because one could say that there's many um, small little creatures that are also hearing the sound vibration and are they becoming self-realized? They may not be becoming self-realized, but they're benefiting by hearing, being in the proximity. But it's true that when one hears transcendental sound vibration and then tries to follow the advice given by Lord Krishna and by the great Vaishnava devotees, then he makes very strong advancement. It's like, for example, if we hear from Lord Krishna that the soul is transcendental and the body is material. The body is not alive and the soul is the life force and the soul is the source of consciousness. So we, we should have confidence in what Krishna says. Who is there to have more confidence in Krishna? Who, who is a higher authority than Krishna? Shiva Varinchi Nutam, Lord Shiva, and Lord Brahma, they were considered the topmost authorities. Even they worship Lord Krishna, Lord Vishnu. And what to speak of? Uh, the great sages such as Vyasadeva, Narad Muni, so many great sages, they're also declaring that Krishna is the Supreme. Uh, in Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna says that you are the Supreme Brahman, Param Brahma, Param Dhamma, Pavitram Paramam Bhavam, Purusham Shashvatam Divyam, Ani Devam Ajam Bhavum. Ahustvam Rishaya Sarve Devar Shir Naradastata Asito Devala Vyasa Swayam Chaiver Bhavishime. All the great sages have declared that you are the supreme absolute truth. There's nothing superior to you. Bhaktak Paratanam Nanya Kinchidasti Tananda Maisarvam Idam Protam Sutra Maniganaiva. There's 
There's no truth beyond Krishna. The impersonalists, they mistakenly think that beyond Krishna, the, the impersonal Brahman is supreme. But Krishna says the opposite in Bhagavad Gita. Brahmanohi pratishtaham amrita sya sitya. I am the basis, he says, of the impersonal Brahman. So the Brahman is the effulgence of Krishna. Krishna is the source of the Brahman effulgence. The Brahman effulgence, yes, is the spiritual world, Brahma Jyoti, Paravyoma, transcendental. And even within the Brahma Jyoti, in one portion there is the Mahatattva, the material world. Ekapad Vibhuti, one quarter. It is said that the material world makes up one quarter of the total manifestation. And the spiritual world is called Tripad Vibhuti, three quarters, three parts. So, there is no truth, no greater personalities, even Brahma, Shiva, what to speak of Indra. They're all worshippers of Krishna. Indra, he, as you know, when Krishna was on this planet 5,000 years ago, Indra became a bit carried away with his position as the uh, King of Heaven. And when Krishna, as a seven-year-old boy, induced his father and other relatives and friends not to perform the Indra Yajna, but instead to perform Govardhan Puja, Indra became furious and he decided to annihilate the whole village of Vrindavan. Everyone was going to be destroyed. He sent the Sambhartaka clouds, which are the clouds used at the time of annihilation of the whole universe. And he spared, he personally came, riding an Aravata. He was he was so angry that this impudent child could stop his worship. Well, Krishna knew that Indra is a devotee, but he's a little carried away. Not a little carried away, he's very carried away by his false ego. But still he's a devotee, so Krishna did not retaliate. He also has weapons. Indra was using his thunderbolt weapon. Krishna has weapons too, but he preferred, he preferred not to use any weapons. He just l used his left finger on the baby finger of his left hand, and he lifted the Govardhan hill and used it as an umbrella for seven days and nights. And in that way he destroyed Indra's pride because Indra was doing everything he could to destroy Krishna and his friends. But Krishna defeated him just by his that simple act. So there's no person greater than Krishna. The demigods are not greater, and certainly the demons are not greater. Hiranyakashipu tried to kill the Supreme Personality of Godhead, Krishna. Krishna, in, at that time, took a different form. He took the form of half man, half lion, Nanahari. And he defeated Hiranyakashipu. And in his incarnation as Lord Ramachandra, he defeated Ravana. And Krishna personally defeated Kangsa. So, the demons are not greater, the demigods are not greater, 
the Brahma Jyoti is not greater. Time is not greater. Time doesn't destroy Krishna. Krishna says, Kalos me, I am time. Time is, you could say, his impersonal energy or one of his energies. So there's nothing. And Krishna's Satchit Ananda Vigraha. His form is eternity, knowledge, and bliss. So eternity means there's no time. And the eternal platform, there's no time. So can we think of anything that's greater than him? Even knowledge. Yasmin vijate sarvam etam vijatam bhavati. If one knows Krishna, he knows everything. Vedaisya sarvaira hameva vejaha. Vedanta krit veda vedeva charam. By all the Vedas, Krishna says, I am to be known. Even Veda knowledge does not go beyond Krishna. It simply leads one to Krishna. If one's a Vedantist, then he should have come to the conclusion, Vasudeva Sarvabhiti, Samahatma Sadurlava, such a great Mahatma, great soul is very rare. And if he doesn't surrender to Krishna after studying the Vedas, then he's wasted his time. He missed the point. He studied the Vedas, but he, he didn't get the essence. Because the Vedas are meant to bring us to the lotus feet of Krishna. That's what the Upanishads are talking about. That's what the Puranas are talking about. That's what the four Vedas are bringing us to. Someone may say, well, the Vedas also talk about demigods and sometimes they say that the devas are supreme. Yes, just like for the wife, husband is supreme. For the disciple, the guru is supreme. There's different supremes. So for one who's in the mode of ignorance, then worshiping different devas or mode of passion, different devas, or demigods or demigoddesses, that may be recommended. But that's recommended only as long as one is still has a desire to remain in the material world. And those who desire to remain in the material world are not considered very advanced by Krishna. In Bhagavad Gita he says, Kamais Tastai Haritta Jnana Devata. Those who have material desires, they worship the demigods and the devas. They want to remain in the material world and enjoy the senses of this material body or different material bodies. But he says, Hritigyana, their intelligence is stolen away by these material desires. So, Yes, the demigods are recommended to be worshipped by those who are not very intelligent. But those who are actually looking for the ultimate, there then the Vedas describe that, yes, if you're looking for the Supreme, then Krishna's two Bhagavan Swayam. Krishna is the source, Krishna is the greatest. And this is not, it's not like there's some kind of competition between Krishna and the devas, because the devas know. Sometimes they forget, as we mentioned a little earlier. Indra forgot, but that was very rare occurrence. It's glorified. In fact, it, it's become a wonderful pastime because Indra did forget. But his forgetfulness turned out to be for our benefit because 
we we now get to we had the opportunity of seeing how Krishna is supreme. Brahma also forgot when Krishna was present. He became bewildered. Brahma Vimohaya. He became bewildered. He had mystic power greater than anyone's and so he got the idea that I will take Krishna's friends, the coward boys and the cows and the calves and I'll put them away by my mystic power in a cave. And let's see if what Krishna, what this little boy can do. So he took his mystic power, which was immense, put them in the cave, looked, then he just put them in, made sure they were blocked in, they couldn't get out, looked back, and what did he see? Who knows? What he said, yes. Um, he saw all the Gopas playing, Gopas and Gopis playing Lord Krishna. Yeah, but he put them in the cave. So how could he see them there? Lord Krishna, like, made him, like, multiply into all his friends. Yes. Krishna expanded himself into the exact same forms of the, the Gopas and the cows and the calves and the, uh, he expanded exactly the same forms so when Brahma looked back they were all there again and he said well wait a minute you know just like we sometimes put our keys someplace and wait a minute I thought I put them over here of course so even Brahma was he doesn't generally become bewildered he's so intelligent but he said, I just put them away. So he went back. Let me see. Uh, let me see if they're still there. Went there. There they were in the cave. And then he looked back, and they were here again. And then Krishna did something even more spectacular. All those cows, calves, coward boys all turned into four-handed Vishnu forms. And they all began to worship little Krishna, child Krishna. Well, that Brahma's mind, he couldn't, he couldn't accommodate it. It was too much. Uh, he didn't know what was going on. He was just bewildered. So he surrendered to Krishna. Oh, even the greatest demigods surrendered to Krishna. The demons are defeated. The demons, they won't surrender unless they're defeated, smashed. The devotees, the demigods, They'll, they'll surrender just when, when they see his greatness. That's their good quality. Brahma bowed down. Indra bowed down. Lord Shiva bowed down. So many great. But the demons, they won't, they'll never bow down. But they bow down when they're defeated, smashed. So, Worshipping Krishna is for those who are interested in reaching the highest perfection. If we just want some temporary benefits, let's say we want some money or we want some physical strength or a beautiful wife or then we can worship the devas for something temporary give me this give me that those who don't know about the Vedic culture they don't know the demigods and they they may try to get favors not from devas but from you know businessmen or politicians or, or someone else. Even a customer, they'll try to get some favor, please buy this product. And that way they try to increase their sense gratification. But those who are not interested in the temporary, who are interested in the transcendental, 
the highest perfection. Ah, oh, that is... For them, Krishna is the exclusive. When we speak of Krishna, we mean Krishna and his expansions, his immediate expansions, and his incarnations, such as Vishnu, or Lord Brahma, the Shringa Varaha, like the Das Avatar. When we speak of Krishna, we're, we're referring to all these different incarnations, these expansions of Krishna. But when we speak of Krishna, it doesn't mean us. Even though we're also expansions of Krishna, but we're a different type of expansion. We're not a personal expansion, we're separated expansions called Vibhinamsha. So we are jiva souls. So we are not in the category of Krishna. We're in the category of living entities. We're also ter eternal, like Krishna. We're also conscious, like Krishna. But we're very tiny, unlike Krishna. He's vibhu. He's great. He's achyuta. He never falls down. But we, we did fall down. We're fallen now. Here we are in the material world, in material bodies. We can't be too proud. Otherwise, why are we in these bodies? It's, it's actually, it's an embarrassment. We're very proud. But actually, we should be very embarrassed that I'm, I'm encased. It's like a person, when he's in prison, they take away his his uh, designer clothes. They say, take off your designer clothes. He says, no, no, I like it. So no, no, put these on instead. And they put him in some striped, striped outfits. And then if he gets out, and he goes out with the striped outfit, everyone says, oh, we know where you're coming from. It's an embarrassment to have those. So similarly, it's an embarrassment for the living entities to be in these material bodies. Mukti hitva anyata rupam sarupena vivastiti. Liberation doesn't simply mean to give up one's individual body or individuality. It means to be reinstated in one's original spiritual form. That's our real nature. We're spirit, we're persons, we have form, we have character, individuality, everything. We have relationship with Krishna, eternal. But now, we're in a state of amnesia. We've forgotten. When a person's in amnesia, he can't remember even his name. He doesn't even recognize his own parents. Sometimes when someone gets hit on the head, some of the Vedas say, or Chaitanya Charitamrita says, <clears throat> um, that uh, when Krishna Bhair Mukahana Bhagavan Chakari, Nikatasta Maya Tari Chapatiatari. Any Bengali speaking here? No. So that's what it means. That when one turns away from Krishna, then the material energy hits him on the head and he gets amnesia. And then he comes into the material world, he forgets who he is forgets Krishna. That's of course a simplified version. It's a little more complicated, but basically that's what happens. We come to the material world to forget about Krishna. Why would we want to forget Krishna? Someone may ask that question because Krishna is, if he's so great, if he's so 
beautiful. He's the most beautiful, the most intelligent, the most kind, the most wealthy. Why would we want to forget him? Because we generally don't like to remember those that we're trying to defeat. Sometimes you may, you may have experienced that if you're not happy with someone or you're competing with them, you may even forget their name. <laughs> because you don't like to think of their name. So, people in the material world, they generally don't chant Hare Krishna because they're trying to forget about him. He's the competitor. Because the Vedas say that he owns everything. But if he owns everything, what about me? What about my possessions? I've just increased, I just bought another skyscraper. I just increased my holdings. But they're saying that this Krishna owns everything. All right, well, we'll, we'll see next year when I take over that bank merger. And we'll show him. So this is our competition. As, as painful as it may sound, it's true. We are competitors to Krishna whenever we try to enjoy this material world. Because, I'll give you an example. So who's in the body, what's the enjoyer? Or who, which part is the enjoyer? Oh, okay, but specifically. The soul. Okay, well, we're talking about the senses now. You're talking about the... He's the actual... Mind. Mind. Well, there's another more... Um, maybe more and Chai will be able to help us. Actually, I'm drawing a blank. The stomach. Ah. The belly is the enjoyer. All the food is given to the belly. And all the parts of the body are engaged to bring the food and give it to the belly. That means the legs have to carry the body, the mind has to figure out, we we'll go get food over there, the eyes have to say the food's there, the hand picks up the food, cuts it up, cooks it, then even the mouth, even the, even the tongue, even the, the teeth, they have to chew it up, but it all goes down to the enjoyer. Now, if any one of the other members of the body, the parts, if they become envious, like if the hand talks to the foot and says, you know, foot, I've been, I've been cutting up and preparing so many dishes, and I've never eaten one of them. All those dishes went to you know where. And the leg said, yes, I'm thinking the same thing. I've been carrying around, I carry all the ingredients, I carry the stomach around all day, I never get any food. And the eyes say, you're feeling like you're not getting it. Look at me, I'm the one, without me, the stomach wouldn't even know where the food is. And I don't get a dish. I don't get one plate. So they decided, all the parts of the body, it's, it became a big meeting. And they decided they passed a resolution, they're going to go on strike. No more giving food to the belly. So for a whole week, they didn't give food to the stomach. Next week, at the meeting, they were all very... And practically they were almost dead. They could hardly, nobody could talk. They said, I don't, know, I don't know what's going on here. I feel terrible. And the feet said, I feel terrible too. The eye said, I also feel terrible. The stomach said, I told you this would happen. If you don't feed me, you'll all be dead. You won't be able to feel any pleasure. If you feed me, then you'll be fine. So Krishna is the supreme enjoyer. And if we try to 
enjoy or not give everything for his pleasure, then we will suffer. He doesn't suffer. Krishna, Krishna is self-sufficient. He's Swaraj. He has his spiritual abode. He's eternal. But when we don't satisfy him or serve him, then we suffer. And the proof is just read the newspapers once in a while, you'll see the suffering going on all over the world. Why? Why so much suffering? Because we're all forgetting Krishna. The world is in a chaotic state. The more we forget Krishna, the more chaos. And someone may say, well, I'm not so sure about that because I know some people that never heard of Krishna and they've got, they're multi-billionaires. They're billionaires. So how's that? How, you said that the more you forget Krishna, the more you suffer. But here's, there are people that don't, have never heard of Krishna at all, and they're billionaires. So what about that? Are they suffering? Well, it may be that they're reaping some of the residual good results of their past pious activities. If someone has a billion dollars, then he's getting the results of his past good karma. But if he doesn't think of Krishna and serve Krishna, then that billion dollars will not actually be a source of pleasure for him because what will he do with that billion dollars? He'll engage in material activities, sense gratification. And he'll become implicated in bad karma and then his future will be full of suffering. 